Today, May 20th, is International Bichette's Awareness Day. Yay! That's why I'm wearing my Bichette's Hope. That's great. And that's why I've got all this crazy blue makeup going on because blue is the Bichette's ribbon color. So, today I want to just talk about Bichette's. I know I'm going to have to do probably... I don't even know, at least four or five other videos, just to even get into Bichette's because it's a very complicated disease, syndrome, whatever you want to call it, but let me talk about it first. Hi, so I apologize, I look like a clown with this crazy hair and this crazy makeup, but I thought, you know, blue, 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 and my hair is crazy because it's falling out because of the drugs I have to take for Bichette's, and I'm sure... Some of you out there know what that's like. And actually, this is more hair than I've had for years. So, you know what? I've got it, so I'm going to enjoy it. I guess most discussions of Bichette's disease syndrome, which I will talk about later, start with the history. And although descriptions of Bichette's like symptoms go back all the way to Hippocrates' writings, um, they were first written and described by a Turkish dermatologist named Lucy Bichette, who described a triad of symptoms in three patients over 17 years. And these were oral lesions or ulcers, genital lesions or ulcers, and eye disease. In short, Bichette's syndrome is basically a systemic vasculitis that is multi-systemic and presents most commonly with oral ulcers, which occur in about 100% of patients, like between 97 and 98%, like it's not a definite thing, but it's pretty close. Um, okay, so oral ulcers, genital ulcers, various skin lesions, which I will get into, um, eye inflammation, I have notes, so I don't feel anything. Um, in some patients, especially in the West, i.e. North America and Western Europe, um, inflammation of the GI tract and inflammatory bowel disease. And most patients, about, I don't know, 50 to 70% in that range, also have non-deforming arthritis. Vichette's also has a very unique geographical distribution in that it is most commonly seen in Turkey, Greece, Iran, like that whole Middle Eastern region, Israel. They call it the Mediterranean Basin, I think. And then down in Africa, and then across into the northern part of India, and it's the far east, like Japan, Korea, and parts of China. And it's still sometimes called the Silk Route Disease because basically the distribution of where it is most prevalent is along the old silk route so interesting the highest prevalences are in turkey which i believe are somewhere between 300 and 400 patients per 100,000 people you compare that to the far east which is also high and it's about 13 to 17 people per 100,000 you compare that to the u.s where it's about 0.38 people per hundred thousand. Bichette's is different from other vascular diseases and rheumatological diseases in that young people like ages 20 to 25 and males are more uh, severely affected than everyone else especially among like the traditional silk route especially middle eastern patients actually in the middle east and along the silk route in general there tend to be more male patients with bichettes than females and conversely, in the United States and Western Europe, it tends to be 
more female patients that present with the sheds than males. So you have to remember there's kind of like almost two major variations of the sheds that I will get into. And within those, they're kind of like clusters, which is why they refer to it as a syndrome and not a disease. The natural course of a pichette is, um, you know, flares and then quiet periods, flares and quiet periods. And depending on how severe your disease is, it can be fairly easily controlled and not last a very long time or be resistant and last a very long time. But overall, the prognosis for patients who are treated immediately and especially those who have just oral and genital ulcers, skin lesions, and possibly arthritis, the prognosis for these people is much better than once you get into the active eye disease, the central nervous system involvement, and vascular, like severe vascular involvement. And actually about two-thirds of patients after treatment go into remission. And like it depends on time. I mean, I guess the framework for time is one, two, and five years. And, um, you know, once the symptoms go away, then they can taper you off the medication. And in two-thirds of Bichette's patients go on to lead normal, healthy lives. So because it is so important to get treatment immediately after the disease is recognized so that it does not go into your eyes and central nervous system and, you know, you don't have thrombophlebitis or, you know, aneurysms, things like that. They want to treat the disease as aggressively as possible, as soon as possible. There's an opportunity to turn off the inflammation, so to speak. Basically, the main criteria for determining how aggressively a patient will be treated for Bichette's is whether that person has started with active eye disease or any systemic organ involvement, at which point it has to be treated very aggressively. Fortunately for most people, um, the most common Bichette's patient has only mucocutaneous involvement, oral and genital ulcers, and various skin lesions, and possibly arthritis. And they could be treated with very mild medications such as colchicine, although I'll get into that because truthfully, colchicine has not really been proven to be very effective for Bichette's, but I'll come back to that. Also hydroxychloroquine, which is plaquenil, and of course, prednisone, right? And if your problems are really mild, like you've just got, you know, a bunch of oral and genital ulcers, there are tons, or even skin lesions, there's tons of topical medications that you can also use. Um, I know personally, I always have on hand, um, well, prednisone drops for my eyes, but prednisone cream, lidocaine cream, lidocaine jelly for ulcers, yeah, and also the magic, oh, I can't bend this finger today, magic mouthwash of some kind. I also get, where is it? I don't know if you can see, lidocaine, 4%. It's just like lidocaine solution, and I swish that or put it on a Q-tip and put it where I need it in my mouth. But a lot of doctors seem to be hesitant to prescribe this, and even at the pharmacy, they're like, she knows not to swallow this, doesn't she? Like, how many years have I been doing this? A lot of years. Okay, so if a patient has more serious disease than just that, and they present with active eye disease or other systemic organ involvement, then immunosuppressive drugs are needed either alone or in combination with steroids sometimes combining two or more immunosuppressive agents. I know I've been on that train for 10 plus years, um, and I've tried almost everything in the book, but I will get to the list of medications too. Um, but uh, these patients in general also tend to get their disease under control, 
and get off meds with time. Although with these kinds of patients, it tends to take longer, like five years or more. So that's the one, two, and five, I guess. I don't really know. I'm not, I'm not a doctor. Statistics wise, as I said, about 100 patients, you know, minus about 2 to 3 percent, present with oral lesion. And what these are basically canker sores, if you've ever had a canker sore, except they're many more in number and much more frequent. I know people who have had 100 ulcers in their mouth at once. And at the height of like well, my ulcer activity, um, I would probably get I don't know, maybe 30 at once and they would last like literally weeks and weeks and weeks. And as that went on, new ones would form and I'd get more and more and more. Um, and they are very painful. Like when people say that the oral ulcers and the genital ulcers, which I will get into too, but the, the oral ulcers are extraordinarily painful. So a mouthful of ulcers and often even down into your throat they go. Um, it, it's sometimes hard to eat or swallow. You can't talk right. Um, I've been there. I've done that. If people say that, take them seriously because trust me, it hurts. So 100%, give or take, have oral ulcers. About 80% present with genital ulcers and skin lesions. About 50% in general, average, present with eye disease of some kind, usually uh, uveitis. If you're talking about young male, especially the Middle Eastern, like Turkish male, the number goes up to about 70%. And if you're talking about like an older woman from say the United States, her chance of eye disease is probably closer to 10 to 15 percent. So there's kind of a, a wide variation there. And it depends, you know, where you live, what your um, genetic background is, because mine is very different from the typical American, um, which I really don't know why. I would like to know, you know, how I got these Middle Eastern genes. Also, arthritis about 50 to 70 percent, and these numbers are so rough, um, present with non-deforming arthritis. And back when I was diagnosed, that's not what they were saying. They they said, you know, it had to be in like, like all your joints, especially your small joints, especially your fingers and your toes and your elbows and your knees. And granted, I've always had arthritis in my hands since as long as I can remember. My mother tells me these stories when I was little and I'd lay in bed and she'd come to wake me up for school and I'd put my hands out and say, please rub my hands, they hurt so bad. But since the time that I developed arthritis with Bichette's, which was about 2008, 2009, they've learned so much more. Um, they're saying that it often affects only a few joints. Mine started in my right SI joint and if you've ever had SI joint involvement you know it's awful. You can't stand, you can't sit, you can't lie down. Like there is no way when that's acting up that you can find a comfortable position. It is awful. I knew before I was treated I was to the point where I was in so much pain between the SI and hip joint pain. And then I've also had nerve involvement, like neuropathy, down my leg um, since I was 14. And it got worse, of course, as the pochettes got worse. And the combination between the neuropathy, radiculopathy, or whatever you want to call it, and arthritis caused me so much pain that I literally like wanted to die. I, I thought, you know, I can't, I can't take this pain. There were times I blacked out because the pain was too bad. I can't even tell you how many times I vomited from the pain. Um, I don't even, it's like one of the places I don't like to go back to and think about because it was awful. And the consequences of being treated for that pain were also awful, which I will talk about in another video. But with eye disease, it is often 
present, usually they say present at the beginning of the onset of symptoms or within five years of having symptoms of the sheds. Now for me, that didn't happen. But what happened with me is my eye disease, which was uveitis and optic neuritis, which is really scary, um, started when I was in that 20, 25 age range um, when Bichette's typically hits. I've had ulcers my whole life. I started with genital ulcers around age 14 was misdiagnosed without being tested for herpes. Sorry if this is TMI, but it's true. It, it needs to be out there. I mean, I know there are other people suffering, and I'm trying to give as much information as I can. So anyway, I was like 14, of course, never had sex, diagnosed with herpes, but was never tested for herpes. I was put on Valtrex. Around the same time, I started having nerve involvement down my sciatic nerve in my right leg which was horrific i had to have nerve blocks um, that literally just paralyzed my leg and um, that actually helped that in physical therapy aqua therapy helped um, and then i guess the pichettes kind of calmed down until i was about 16 almost 17 and then the genital ulcers became so bad and so huge it was literally like like tennis balls and I'm a girl um that would open and for me I don't know if this is typical but with my Bichette's ulcers they would open and then kind of peel off over time which was incredibly 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 painful as genital ulcers and it got to the point where there were so many of them and they were so huge and so inflamed that I had to go to the hospital because I couldn't go to the bathroom. Um, and it was at that point when I was, I believe 17, it was in 2003. Yeah, I'm old, right? Um, which is crazy. I, I always thought that I was diagnosed kind of like a little later with the sheds, but I was actually diagnosed only about five years after Joanne Zeiss, if you know who that is. She's kind of a pioneer in Bichette's awareness. But anyway, 2003, I was about 17, graduating high school, and I had an infectious disease doctor come in, test me for herpes. It was negative twice. And so he said, I think this is Bichette's. And at that point, I didn't know really what it was. I was just really thrilled to have a diagnosis after having symptoms my whole life. And actually, I had um, another disease, common variable immune deficiency, which still had not been diagnosed. So I thought this was all part of the Bichette. But anyway, I started on treatment and things were kind of up and down. And I will tell the rest of that story later. In short, um, things got very bad when, again, I was in that 20 to 25. It went into my joints severely. It went into my eyes severely. It went back into my nerves. It went into my brain. And it was just not good. I started with the phlebitis. And I've been kind of on that track since. But I've been treating things aggressively with the doctors. But anyway, we'll get back to Bichette's very quickly.